Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to Life on the Wrist. Hope you guys are doing okay today. We're gonna to be talking about something vintage today. The Geneva Watch Auction number 14 is taking place in a couple of weeks. It's gonna be held obviously in Geneva and will be taking place from uh, November 5th to, uh, excuse me, November 5th and November 7th. There's a ton of watches that are being auctioned off. A lot of the times what I like to do with these is go through some of my favorite picks um, and discuss obviously the histories of the watches and what I think they'll end up fetching for. Um, it's really nice to see a group of watches that are being curated for this Geneva watch auction. There's obviously modern watches and vintage watches in this. Most of my picks are gonna be vintage, but I will touch on a couple of modern watches as well. Um, so I'll put up some pictures, but also put a link in the show notes, or excuse me, not in the show notes, in the description of this video, so you can go and see the rest of these watches. I'll put a link to uh, the Philips's, Philips's um, auction website. Um, if you want to see and hear a little bit more about these watches, be sure to head over to our website where we have a corresponding video for this art uh, for this a corresponding article for this video. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was actually um, something that maybe you as a modern watch collector might be familiar with and that is the um, the new Rolex Oyster Perpetuals that that came out with some kind of interesting dials. There was the Tiffany blue dial, there was an orange dial version and there was um, like a mustard yellow version. What's really interesting is there's actually a couple of those watches that are going to be auctioned in this in this auction. I find it a little bit sad. A lot of people are actually trying to find these watches and so when they go to Rolex and they try and pick one of these up, a lot of times there's a wait list or they're very, very expensive um, on the secondhand market or the gray, gray market. So there are a couple of these. I saw Tiffany blue, I saw an orange and a yellow one. Um, whatever your opinions are of sort of Rolex's production, I thought this was an interesting thing to discuss for this auction, but I'm not really going to focus on them. The first two lots are actually two new Oyster Perpetuals. They're estimated to go between 4,000 and 7,000 Swiss francs. Who knows what they'll end up going for, especially when you think about the secondhand prices of these watches. But moving into the watches that I really wanted to talk about. The first one is lot number 17, and this watch is from Habering. It's actually a limited edition watch that... Um, is um, it's called the Irwin tribute to WWW and this watch was essentially a watch that was created um, by Habering to mimic a lot of um, uh, incredible um, basically like the historical watches so the watch itself is in stainless steel has a deadbeat seconds uh, movement has this really black very vintage looking dial um, and has these large um, Arabic numerals on it. This is a really cool piece from a brand that maybe you probably, I don't know if you have or have not, but Habering is a, a brand that maybe you haven't heard of so much, but they're a small manufacturer that does some really incredible watchmaking, and it's cool that this watch is a limited edition of 10 pieces that's actually going to be sold. WWW stands for um, Watches, Wine, and Wonders, and um, Habering has been up for multiple um, GPHG awards and so it's definitely a brand that you should sort of know. It was manufactured in 2018. It's set to go between 3,000 and 5,000 Swiss francs. I'm not really sh super knowledgeable about the Habering, Habering's pricings. Um, so I'm actually curious to see what this ends up going for. I would say Philips is fairly, um, fairly well versed in what these types of watches would go for. So somewhere in between there is probably right. The next lot I wanted to talk about was a um, a lot that um, is very similar to one of the watches that was sold at Life on the Wrist recently, and that is lot number 36. This is an Automa Piguet reference 5131BA, and the reason why it's very um, sort of close to Life on the Wrist is it has a disco volante sort of um, shape to its case. Um, the watch itself is a yellow gold watch retailed by, uh, by Tuller. It actually has Tuller, the Tuller signature on the dial. In 1959, it was manufactured, and the uh, diameter of the case is 34 millimeters. Um, what makes this watch really stand out is obviously you've got this dial that's sort of in the middle of the watch, and then you have this really great big bezel with um, it looks like um, uh, uh, I think it's uh, hobnail sort of um, uh, finishing to it. The reason why this is special, this Automa PG is very similar to a Patek Philippe we recently sold that had a very similar case shape. I encourage you to check out our website so you can see that watch. But what I really like about this is it's not your run-of-the-mill vintage Automa PG. It has the 19, 
1959, 1960s uh, design to it. Um, it's expected to go between 3,000 and 5,000 Swiss francs. I think it might be towards the upper end of that, just considering where um, sort of Disco Volantes have sort of um, sold for uh, from, from, from my sort of research and experience in these with these watches. I think they're becoming a little bit more um, attractive to many collectors as vintage watches become just a little bit more expensive. These types of models have become a little bit more um, interesting to someone who's trying to purchase an Automa PGA. So a really cool, cool watch. What's really interesting is this was actually, Gel Gento was actually one of the first people to actually design a watch similar to this. So I thought that was quite an interesting, um, interesting piece. These watches are dress watches, so it's gonna be ultra thin as well. The next watch I wanted to talk about was from Vacheron Constantin. This is lot number 38. It's the reference 5300S. This was manufactured in, um, in 2015, and this is a pink gold single button chronograph. So if you know me, I really love chronographs. The fact that this is a mono pusher chronograph is even more incredible. It also has a power reserve indicator, pulsometer dial, um, and this is uh, one of a limited edition run of watches that was manufactured by Vacheron Constantin. This is number 36 of the 260 pieces that were created. Um, so the reason why, this is called the uh, Harmony Chronograph and it's basically paying tribute to the cushion-shaped mono pusher chronographs in the 1930s that Vacheron Constantin created. Um, the watch itself is running on the manual wind caliber 3300. I'll put up a picture of it because it really is a sight to be seen. Obviously you have that gold uh, balance, uh, balance wheel, uh, I guess, uh, bridge. It's really cool, but it also has the the movement also has this sort of darker finishing on some of the pieces, which I think gives it a really nice depth. I absolutely love chronographs. Um, it's just something that I that that speaks to me, and the white dial with this sort of bluish, the blue numerals really um, looks incredible to me. I also like the uh, pulsometer dial that you can see with characters in sort of a dark red. It really is a beautiful watch from Vacheron Constantin. It's estimated to go between 20 and 30,000 Swiss francs. I don't think that's really a good estimate. I think it's probably gonna go for closer to 40,000 Swiss francs, just considering the fact that this is a limited edition from Vacheron Constantin, mono pusher chronograph, and basically has every aesthetic that a vintage watch lover really loves. So we'll see what that ends up going for. Moving forward, uh, lot number 61. This is a Patek Philippe reference 570. It's another reference that I absolutely love. This one isn't the one that really, um, that, that I um, love the most. There are a couple of variations of the re reference 570. I'm sure you've seen them on some of the talking watches from Hodinkee, or perhaps you know a collector who has a 570, I'm jealous. Um, but this is a, a, a um, very rare variation of the 570 in stainless steel with Brigand numbers, and it has a three-tone dial. One of the things that it also has is a long signature, which um, isn't as common with with these watches. Um, the watch itself was manufactured in 1943, 36 millimeters. It's a 570, uh, nicknamed uh, Calatravone, um, and is uh, an absolute wild watch to, to, to enjoy. The watch itself is a little bit larger than the original Calatrava, which is uh, why the name is called Calatrovo Calatravone, which is Italian for large Calatrava. Um, it's estimated to go between 200 and 400,000 Swiss francs. I think this is a decent um, estimate. I think I saw one 570 a couple of auctions ago go for somewhere within this band. Um, I do think the fact that this is one of the, you know, a large Calatrava is I think going to change things with, with what this might go for. I'm saying it's probably gonna go for the upper end of that 400,000 mark, maybe a little bit more, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see what the, what the watch market um, thinks about this piece, but an absolute favorite of mine, uh, absolutely beautiful piece. The next one I wanted to talk about is a really sort of oddball watch from, from Patek Philippe. This watch was manufactured in 1983. So if you put yourself in 1983, you can imagine quartz crisis, you can imagine brands trying to innovate and, be, and create things that are going to be attractive to many pieces, uh, to many uh, attract customers to some of their pieces. This is lot number 65, Patek Philippe, reference 3770-011. This watch is one of three known yellow gold 3770s to appear on the market. The model is called the Naughty Lips. And if you look at this watch, this is a quartz watch from Patek, from Patek Philippe. 
Um, and if you look at it, obviously you're going to see the Nautilus uh, characteristics in this watch. But one other thing that you see is the Ellipsis watch is that Patek Philippe is known for. What Patek Philippe basically did was they took in the Nautilus, the Ellipsis, that, that they are you know, two watches that they're known for creating, merged them into one, and then you basically got this. So you have a lot of these similar sort of porthole characteristics of the Nautilus with an integrated bracelet, but the watch itself is stretched out just a little bit. Um, and has a really unique looking looking case. Sort of a two-toned-ish dial, um, only hours and minutes uh, for your complications. Like I said, it's a quartz watch, an 18 karat yellow gold, running on the caliber E27. It's pretty incredible that Patek Philippe did create um, some of these, uh, you know, a, a quartz piece. This is estimated to go between 10 and 15,000 Swiss francs. I think this is on the lower end again. This is a very unique watch and one that sort of tells the history and the story of Patek Philippe during this era. So I think it's probably going to go for more than 15,000 Swiss francs. Moving forward, um, I think I always try and cover a Patek Philippe chronograph because I do think that Patek Philippe chronographs are really what make watch auctions extremely special. This is the Patek Philippe reference 1463. It's a yellow gold, um, yellow gold chronograph in 35 millimeters, uh, this is like your quintessential vintage Patek Philippe uh, chronograph, 1463 is the reference. Manufactured in 1968, sold by Tiffany with a Tiffany dial. Um, it's one of the most popular chronographs from Patek Philippe. Um, when it comes to vintage chronographs, this is one that you probably see in most people's collections if they do, if they are interested in, in vintage Patek Philippe. It's estimated to go between 120 and 180,000 Swiss francs. I think that's probably right. Um, I'd say that, that um, like I said, this is a quintessential chronograph if you're a Patek Philippe collector or a chronograph collector. Um, so another really cool watch. Um, there, there are some other Patek Philippe chronographs. This one's actually in very, very good condition. There's some other Patek Philippe chronographs that have some really nice oxidation on the dial, on the case of their, the, the watches, which I think is also really cool. Moving forward, this is for me by far one of the best, uh, well, I'm gonna say second best lots because there's one coming up that I wanna spend some time talking about, but um, this is the um, lot number 167. This is a Vacheron Constantin Chocolatone, reference 4737. This is an extremely important Chocolatone. We on the channel, I on the channel have covered the Chocolatone and, and, and Vacheron Constantin's history with this watch. It's a watch that I fell in love with really early on. Um, they've they had a bunch of references throughout the years. The 4737 is um, a reference that I have covered. It's a fairly rare reference within the lineup. Until this watch was discovered, it was, no, it was believed that there were 335 examples of this 4737 reference from Vacheron Constantin. 269 examples in yellow gold, 62 in pink gold, and then four in white gold. What you have here is the first ever known 4737 from Vacheron Constantin in platinum. This isn't something that, uh, this watch is, obviously the rarity of this watch is absolutely um, insane. Um, what's really cool is you're actually able to trace this watch back to its original owner. Um, the watch itself, was um, it was uh, created and retailed in Madrid in 1956, and then it basically stayed with its with the owner of this watch, who eventually went to the Dominican Republic, and that is who the watch was with before uh, Philips has has taken it on for this auction. Um, like I said, the only known platinum version of the. Um, 4737 this is an iconic watch for Vacheron Constantin and it's going to be very difficult to put an estimate on, on what this watch is going to go for. Because of its rarity, its history and um, in my opinion the provenance of being with the original owner, I think the estimates are really going to be hard to, to, to agree with. So 1956, 36 millimeters in diameter estimated to go between 200 and 400 thousand Swiss francs. I don't know. like. When, when you have a watch like this that comes to market, it's actually quite difficult to say, hmm, this is the only known platinum 4737 from Vacheron Constantin. What do you think it's actually gonna go for? To be honest, I think it could go for 500,000 Swiss francs. The problem is, you don't know, like I think Philips obviously has an idea of the types of, of collectors who are gonna be interested in, in, in uh, bidding on this watch. And so they may know some of the interest, but 
there, there is interest that perhaps you will not know of and it can really blow up the estimates for these ones so um, lot number 167 I am super excited to see what this what this ends up going for all right, the next lot that I'm super excited to um, to talk about. This is the watch that I was talking about as being the, um, for me, being the uh, the best lot of the auction. Uh, it's um, lot number 192. It's from MBNF. It's um, a prototype LM1 that they created where they were experimenting with the lugs on these watches. So it was manufactured in 2011, and um, this is a legacy machine number one prototype nicknamed Longhorn. Uh, it's a stainless steel watch that, that MBNF was basically trying to figure out how they wanted to design the lugs of their watches. And one of them were these quite long extended, um, extended um, lugs that, that jut out quite far. And the problem with those is it sort of limits your audience on, and, and it means that for some people, if you have longer lugs, it may hang over and not look as great for, their, for, their, um, for that collector. But one of the things that Max sort of talked about when, when, when discussing this watch was they actually had an idea to create these extended lugs and then basically have two drill, uh, lug hole, um, two spring bar positions on the lugs. So you can actually decide, do you want your, your, um, your strap to be close to the case, to be further away, depending on, on how you like to wear your watches or perhaps the size of your wrist. There's a lot of innovation that went into this watch. This watch, this obviously the Longhorn didn't become the the um, the the case design for the LM1, um, but a really cool cool story here. Um, what's really cool about this watch too is a, a portion of the proceeds are going to be um, donated to to, um, to charity, um, and it's going to the Save the Rhino International Foundation, which is in. Uh, the spirit of the name Longhorn, which I think is very exciting, so um, it can support the conservation for rhinos. Um, there's no reserve with this, with this, but it is estimated to go between 80 and 150 thousand Swiss francs. I really hope it goes for more, so that more money can be donated to um, Save the Rhino Foundation. Lastly, um, the last piece I'm going to go over is lot number 248. This is obviously a very historical watch. Um, for uh, any collector, but really any um, any person who's sort of into the history of dive watches, and this is a um, it's the uh, Rolex stainless steel and gold ultra di deep dive wrist watch with a center seconds on it. This is a watch that uh, plays a very big part in um, in the history of watches, really. So. If you don't know um, when these watches, uh, when when Rolex sort of was working through um, working through the um, the depths that their watches could be taken to, they created these pieces that basically go to extreme lengths. And um, there were a couple of watches that were manufactured like this. But there were a lot of them actually went into um, into um, testing and went to extreme depths. We're talking about 11,000 um, meters below sea level, which is a really ridiculous thing to really think about. Um, and what's cool is those watches were actually functioning, and I think it's a testament to what Rolex can do when it comes to um, to uh, to um, when it comes to uh, dive watches. So in 1953, they tested a couple of prototypes that they were working on where they basically strapped these watches to the outside of um, a submersible and they actually went to, it first went to uh, um, 1,080 meters, then it went to 3,150 that same year. And they continued to sort of work on this and now have um, some commemorative, commemorative pieces that they've created. Um, they, this one is number 35, which is from the Ruppertaler, which was formerly in the Ruppertaler Uhren Museum and is going to be offered here at, at auction. It's estimated this was completed in 1966 um, and it has this really crazy domed crystal, which I think makes it stand out. It's estimated to go between 1.2 and 2.4 million Swiss francs. This is a piece of history. Again, I think it's very difficult to put a number on, on a historical piece. But I think that's probably a good estimate. 
So those are my picks for the um, Philips Genial Watch Auction number 14. Let me know what you think about the picks. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Also, let me know what your favorite pick is um, from this auction. There's some really incredible pieces. Um, for me, the 4737 from Vacheron Constantin and the MBNF really stood out to me. So I'm super excited to see what those go for. Again, this is taking place the 5th and 7th of November. So be sure to check out the auction at that time. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. Um, this one is a little bit longer uh, because I sort of changed the cadence of my videos. Um, I'm going to hopefully provide you guys with some longer videos um, that you'll enjoy. So uh, be sure to stay tuned. If you are new to the channel, be sure to hit the subscribe button if you like these types of videos. If you wouldn't mind hitting the like button for us, it really does help us out with our YouTube analytics. With that said guys, thank you so much for watching this video and until next time.